Robinson Yes, Mr. Laddie. Um, <coughs> what about it? We, we think it will be um, helpful <laughs> if we all adopt a, a common approach of uh, referring to Ms. Robinson as the claimant and His Highness as, as the respondent. That deals with starting point. For <laughs> there we are. But actually that should have been point two because point one should have been to say that we're, we're very pleased to see everybody physically present before us in court. I know that from uh, pre-10.30 discussions that feeling is entirely mutual. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, can I uh, start with the formalities please, my Lord? Yes. I appear with Mr Mark Greaves on behalf <coughs> of the respondent and my little friends Ms Williams, QC and Mr Stevenson appear yes. on behalf of Thank you. <coughs> Can I just check that we're all working from the same documents and uh, uh, that everyone's got everything that's been sent to the court? There's a core bundle. Yes. And a supplementary bundle. No. Oh, yes. Sorry, yes. Little one. Yes. Little one. Uh, I, I don't know to what extent, if any, that will be referred to. Uh, that's not a promise. It's just a forecast. Um, the, then, in terms of authorities, there's an authorities bundle main authorities bundle to which we added three additional authorities yesterday. Can I confirm that the court has that? Well, we're, we're certainly speaking for myself, I have the, the, the original bundle. I don't have any additional authorities. No, I, I haven't seen them. Were they sent electronically? <coughs> they, yes, they were. Yes. We've, got, we've, got hard we've got hard copies as well, if the court wouldn't mind those. I don't think you have got hard copies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there were hard copies. Apparently there were hard copies handed up as well, so they were sent electronically and via hard copy. I'm sorry. No, they haven't got to us yet. Are you going to need them <coughs> this morning? Uh, yes, <coughs> actually. Quite um, early on. Should we ask, should we ask I'm terribly sorry, but it... Gareth. Yes, I think. Was yes. Gareth Carlton very good? Yes. Robin, should we ask Gareth? We, we, we'll just see if one of our clerks can um, track down the, the errant hard copies. Lord, Lord Justice Singh's clerk, Gareth. He's just a client there. I'll ask you there. Yes, yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, thanks very much. <coughs> um, I, I, I'm terribly sorry, but at least I've established that at the outset. Yes. Um, can I just say something about timings and the, and, mm -hmm. and the batting order, if that's okay? Of course, this is, my Lord, entirely subject to the court's approval. As you'd have expected, uh, Ms. Williams and I have spoken about mm -hmm. the most sensible way of providing up the advocacy. Our proposal is as follows, for me to develop uh, the respondent's appeal on the illegality question, I estimate that will take me around three or so hours, right. then to pass to Ms Williams to answer that and to develop her own appeal on the interim relief question, back to me to answer that appeal, to reply on illegality, and then back to Ms Williams. Uh, that, that will take the two days. Um, this is right. an appeal that took three days uh, before the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Obviously, there's fewer questions uh, before this court because the issue of protected disclosures and causation is, is no longer alive. Um, I don't know whether that meets with your Lordship's mm. approval. Yes. 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 Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think we were expecting it to take a, a full two days, but we're, we're happy with the general shape of it. Yes. Understood. <laughs> Noted. Gladly, <laughs> <laughs> we. Um, <coughs> Lord Justice Singh's clerk informs you that we haven't received uh, the elect electronic copies or, or hard copies of the three authorities. Very well. I'm going to ask Mr. Greaves sitting behind me to make sure to ask uh, uh, the magicians at Matrix to come bring additional hard copies, and I'll just simply have to defer that, those part of my, that part of my submissions. I'll explain when they, when they come Is that up. the quickest way to do it? Alternatively, they can be sent to me. Uh, if they, if they could be emailed, they could be printed out here. To Lord Justice Singh's clerk? Yes. 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 No. Take an email. Gareth. Gareth. Williams. One. At justice. Gov. Uk. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Gareth. Right. The race is on to see if I can, <coughs> if uh, they can arrive before uh, before I get to that part of my submissions. Um, <coughs> I, I appreciate that, uh, that my lords will have read. I discussed an argument to the government, <coughs> but if it, if it assists, I propose to give a very potted history of what we say are the salient facts. I'm conscious that uh, uh, not everybody who will be watching this is in court and, and may not have access to all of the documents. So uh, uh, if the 
court will permit me to do so. What, what I propose to do is simply outline what we say are the salient facts, and in each case, give my lords the relevant paragraph reference in the employment tribunal decision. Yes. Which is, a, I think, the page 217 of the core bundle. The claimant commenced her employment on the 30th of March 2007 under the terms of a contract dated 23rd of March 2007. The contract provided for her to be paid £34,000 per annum gross on which she would be paid, on which she would be responsible for paying tax. See paragraph 16 of the tribunal judgment. In June 2009, her pay was raised to £37,000 gross, all other arrangements remaining the same. See Tribunal Paragraph 18.6. In 2011, the respondent, who had previously <coughs> lived outside the United Kingdom, instituted a review of his domestic taxation arrangements by specialist consultants and solicitors. See paragraph 35. On the 30th of January 2014, the claimant met with the respondent's advisor, Mr. Peter Cathcart, a solicitor, and they had a conversation about the review of the respondent's taxation arrangements. During the course of that discussion on the findings of the employment tribunal, the claimant revealed to Mr Cathcart that she had not paid <coughs> any tax on any of her earnings over the previous seven or so years. Mr Cathcart did a back-of-the-envelope calculation <coughs> and told the claimant that she owed £50,000 odd in terms of back taxes, but with penalties, the sum could be as high as £100,000. The claimant asked if the respondent <coughs> would pay the sums owing. Mr Cathcart, on the respondent's behalf, said not. The Employment Tribunal found that the failure on the part of the claimant to declare any earnings to HMRC was knowing and deliberate. Those findings that I've just referred to are found at paragraphs 38 to 45 of the Tribunal's decision. On the 1st of July 2014, the respondent informed the claimant that going forward, he would deduct monies meeting her tax liabilities from the pay that she would otherwise have received and place them in a separate account so that the tax problem would not be compounded. And I emphasise the word compounded, which is cited in the Tribunal's judgment at paragraph 59, quoting from the respondent's letter to the claimant. On the 9th of July 2014, the claimant claimed for the first time that the original arrangement, that's to say the letter of the 23rd of March 2007, provided for her to be paid net, in other words, £34,000 net. If this was true, it would have meant that the respondent and not the claimant would have been responsible for paying tax to HMRC. And that the pay against which tax was to be calculated would be greater than that that would be the case if the 34,000, later 37,000 pounds was paid gross. Mr. Laddie, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can, can I ask you a very basic question? Uh, forgive me. Why wasn't that the responsibility of the respondent anyway? If, if the claimant was an employee, presumably she was a Schedule E taxpayer. And shouldn't it all have been done through PAYE? Yeah, there are two answers to that question. First of all, the party's initial position was that she wasn't an employee. That, in fact, remained the respondent's position all the way through to the tribunal hearing, that she was self-employed. 
accordingly, from the respondent's perspective, he was never under such an obligation, ever. He appreciated that in the light of the tribunal's finding that she was in fact an employee, historic retrospectively, that became, at least in part, subject to the second point that I'm going to come to, the respondent's responsibility. But as my law will appreciate, uh, disputes, disagreements, entirely bona fide ones about precise employment status categorization are commonplace. Yes. The second point is this. For much of the period, indeed, I think for the period 2007 to 2011, the respondent lived abroad. He was the, he was the employer of the claimant. I, I don't, for one moment, pretend to be a tax expert. But I understand that in those circumstances where the employer lives abroad, <coughs> he's an individual who lives abroad, there isn't a requirement to institute a PAYE system. Right, I see. Yes, I, I can understand, and, and, and uh, my understanding is that there's no dispute about the position in the period 2007 to 2014, and I, and, I don't, and I don't want to open up what may be a can of worms there. But what may be material to the present appeal is what was the true position from 2014 to 2017, and. The, uh, speaking for myself only, I'm having some difficulty at the moment in understanding what the legal basis was for the employer to say, I will deduct the tax that's due and keep it in a separate account. Because <coughs> if somebody's self-employed, how, <coughs> how can you do that? That may be, be, that's dealt with in the employment tribunal's decision. Right. Um, <coughs> they, they describe the employer as being in an invidious position um, because he was concerned that the claimant, having effectively told him that uh, she hadn't paid any tax between 2007 to 2014, and then having suggested that the, she was due to be paid net rather than gross, was simply going to continue paying monies, to, continue failing to pay monies to HMRC, monies which as far as he was concerned, both parties agreed she had responsibility for paying over by way of tax liability. I appreciate in the light of the subsequent finding of the tribunal that she was an employee, that proved to be wrong. The respondent's concern was he didn't <coughs> want to run the risk of being perceived to be a party on a fraud, on a fraud to the revenue. He was stuck in a cleft stick. On the one hand, it may be that from a civil law point of view there was no authority for to unilaterally deduct sums from her pay packet. But on the other hand, he knew that if he paid the sums over to the claimant, she would not pay them to HMRC. It was the lesser of two evils. Were, were HMRC, I don't think there are any findings about this, but were, were HMRC party to any of this? Because uh, one might have expected that they wouldn't go into a separate account, it would go to HMRC. Well, I can, I, I can answer that. Uh, uh, on the findings of the tribunal, in fact, it was the next point I was going Sorry. to come to. Not at all. On the findings of the tribunal, it, on the 18th of July 2014, the respondent wrote to HMRC and explained the position. And when you say the position, did that include what he was now doing? Yes. By way, so he was explaining the historic position for the previous seven years, and <coughs> the arrangement Absolutely. he had now. Absolutely. And can, I, and can I fast forward? The, the, of course, the respondent never had the claimant's tax details. I'll just deal with this, this particular point. Never had the, the, the claimant's tax details. You'll have read in the employment tribunal decision that the account was created, this separate holding account was created. And as the respondent saw it, uh, and indeed informed the claimant that this was the <coughs> position, the money was being held there pending its release upon the claimant's instructions to HMRC. <coughs> that never occurred because throughout the claimant falsely contended the money was hers as opposed to tax liability. When we talk about tax, are we also including national insurance? Yes, I believe that's right. On the base, I, I, it, <coughs> should be, it should be said that was calculated on the basis that she was self-employed rather than an employee. The, the deduction. Which did make a minor difference to the to the overall sums. Was that by agreement? 
No, of course, it wasn't by agreement at all because the, the, the claimant railed against it. I see. The, claim, the claimant didn't, didn't agree with any of it. So. Absolutely. But she, she falsely, we would say, contended that the money was all hers because she falsely contended that she was right. due to be paid net. Thank you. Hmm. Um, Mr. Laddie, I'm, I'm sorry to add to what is now a comprehensively three way interruption of your submissions. I forgot how much fun it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think you're at the moment referring to paragraph 62 of the the yes, ET's decision. Um, and, and, and speaking for myself, um, I, I hadn't been able to find um, how the story developed from there. We, we, we're told in 62 that the respondent wrote to the revenue, as you have just said. We're told in 63 that the tribunal found that the revenue replied in September. Um, but that paragraph ends, the respondent did not reply. Yeah. And the C correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I haven't seen any finding as to what, if anything, the revenue ever said about this arrangement, the, the putting the money in an account arrangement. They, they didn't say anything about the putting the money in the account arrangement. It is fair to say they subsequently provided their opinion to the claimant who wrote separately say, as to employment status. Yes. <coughs> They didn't say anything about the arrangement. When the monies were paid, ultimately paid over by the respondent to HMRC, HMRC wrote back and said, and this is in, uh, I think, 2017 or 2018. 2018. <coughs> they wrote back and said, this has been put in our suspense account because we don't <coughs> have the tax details for the claimant because the claimant had refused to provide her national insurance number to the respondent. This is, this is all by way of completing the story. It's not, I'm not pretending it's in any way central. Yeah. It wasn't at all straightforward for the respondent to send the money to HMRC, get it in the right place, so that the HMRC registered it, registered it as against the claimant. That was ultimately done. I'm not pretending it wasn't, but it wasn't an entirely straightforward exercise. The authorities have arrived, as you call it, later. Yes. Thank you for the interruptions, because they've allowed me. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was our sole purpose, Mr. Manning. <laughs> I know, but it's, that's why my lords are in the Court of Appeal. Able with many things at once. <laughs> or... um, I think we'd got to the 18th of July 2014, and my lord pointed out it's paragraph 62. I can deal swiftly with tw 20, the, pos the position between 2015 and 2017. There was essentially a standoff during the period of this time. There was correspondence between the parties, some of which the tribunal subsequently found were amounted to protective disclosures, not a live issue on this appeal. But things came to a head on the 23rd of March 2017, see paragraph 77. The respondent, via, its via his employment solicitors, warned the claimant that if she did not pay her back taxes, she would be dismissed. She did not do so, and she was dismissed on the 29th of May 2017. See Employment Tribunal paragraphs 81 to 82. Do they use the language of dismissal? Or do they say the contract will be terminated? I think it's the contract will be terminated. In yeah. fact, in the supplemental bundle, I think so that we wouldn't refer to it, the last two pages are the dismissal letter. I'm calling it the dismissal letter, uh, um, recognising the way that the tribunal yeah. does it, but I'm pretty sure from recollection that it says the contract will be terminated. See that page 58, first paragraph. Yeah. And uh, since we have this in front of us, it may be of assistance also to look at the final paragraph on page 59.
I was proposing only to um, flit through the procedural history. The claimant brought various claims, including an application for interim relief. That was heard before Employment Judge Stewart relatively swiftly, swiftly in uh, June 2017. He granted interim relief. Uh, that's my learned friend's appeal, so I'm going to say little about that at this stage. That was subject to an appeal to Her Honour Judge Edie, as she then was, in the Employment Appeal Tribunal over Christmas 2017. That appeal was successful. The matter was remitted back to Judge Stewart on limited grounds. In April uh, 2018, uh, <clears throat> the remitted hearing took place. For reasons that have still not been explained, Judge Stewart didn't promulgate his decision until the second day of the full hearing of the claimant's substantive complaints in November 2018, the hearing before employment Judge Goodman and members. Judge Goodman dismissed all of the claimant's claims including on the defence advanced by the respondent of illegality. Her promulgation of that decision was commendably swift. And the reason I point that out is because it allowed, as it happened, the respondent to apply for a reconsideration of Stuart 2, the interim relief decision, within the 14-day time limit prescribed by the Employment Tribunal Rules of Procedure. The respondent also submitted a precautionary appeal against Stuart II, pending the outcome of the reconsideration application. In the meantime, the claimant appealed the Employment Appeal Tribunal against the Goodman decision. There were six grounds of appeal, the first three of which concerned <coughs> illegality. Grounds four to six are no longer relevant for the purposes of this appeal. In January 2019, Judge Stewart refused to reconsider his judgment in Stewart 2, and so the respondent appealed against that as well. I have spent some time trying to edit down that, that rather torturous procedural history, and I'm afraid that's as, as good as it gets. <coughs> Thank you. As my Lords would appreciate, all of the appeals were heard before Mr Justice Lewis, as he then was in the Employment Appeal Tribunal in December 2019, and it is formally against that decision which this appeal is brought, although as my Lords would appreciate uh, the, the, the tenor of the authorities in relation to second appeals to the Court of Appeal is that, the, is that this Court is, of course, at least as concerned with the correctness of the original decision as the decision My Lords, I, I wanted to make two points on the law before we go into the specifics on the appeal. And can I just state in advance what they are? The first is to highlight what we say are the principles that can be distilled in this area from the three leading authorities. And second, to spend a moment with the assistance of the documents that have just been brought in by Lord Justice Singh's clerk. At the, at the standard of review in illegality cases, because I, I'm conscious that's something that neither party has addressed in its skeleton arguments, and it may be something that the court is interested in considering. The relevant law can be distilled in my submission from three authorities, just three authorities, and they're all referred to by both parties. Um, so this shouldn't take long, but if I can just provide this as a way of headlining the submissions that we're due to make, it may be of some assistance. The first authority is Hall and Woolston Hall in this, in, in this court. That's tab 18 of the authorities one. 
Oh. <coughs> I don't think we have <coughs> tabs. We have page numbers. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, it should be. Oh, everyone's working from a hard copy. It's his page one hundred and six. Thank you. This was a case of a um, worker at a golf club who became aware, who, she knew that she was being paid £250 cash per week. She became aware that her employer was recording this for revenue purposes as £250 gross in order to reduce its tax liability. When she asked the employer about it, the employer said that's how they do their business. She was subsequently dismissed when she had told her employer that she was pregnant. She brought a claim of sex discrimination. The question arose, was that, was that claim of sex discrimination barred by the doctrine of illegality advanced by uh, the respondent employer? If we could turn within this uh, to paragraph 30, please. Judgment of Lord Justice Peter Gibson under the heading illegality under English law. Paragraph 30, there's a reference to two types of case in which it is well established that illegality renders a contract but unenforceable in the outset. And then at 31, there's a reference to a third category of case, that's the one that we're dealing with, a case where a party may be prevented from enforcing it, that's to say the contract, where a contract lawful when made is illegally performed and the party knowingly participated in that illegal performance. And there's a reference to the earlier decision of the Court of Appeal <coughs> in Ashmore Benson, which is in our authorities bundle, but I don't need to refer to it. Paragraph 32. In the employment law field, the test of knowledge plus participation has also been recognised for illegality to be a defence. There is subsequently a review of a number of employment cases where knowledge plus participation was held to be the touchstone. Can I take the court, please, to paragraph 38? And just before we go there, paragraph 33, Lord Justice Peter Gibson appears to cite Coral Leisure with approval. Can I come back to that? Of course. When I, I'm, I'm, I wasn't seeking to skip over it. I'm obviously going to address Coral and, uh, Coral and Barnet. Yes. But I'll come back to it at the appropriate time. Okay. Uh, in terms of understanding the headline principles, paragraph 38, second line, in cases where the contract of employment is neither entered into for an illegal purpose nor prohibited by statute, the illegal performance of the contract will not render the contract unenforceable unless, in addition to knowledge of the facts which make the performance illegal, the employee actively participates in the illegal performance. It is a question of fact in each case whether there has been a sufficient degree of participation by the employee. <coughs> so it appears on the judgment of Lord Justice Peter Gibson that it's a factual question for the tribunal. Uh, and I appreciate that Coral and Barnett is referred to again. <coughs> Coral, as Coral and Barnett shows, even if the employee has in the course of his employment <coughs> illegal acts, he may nevertheless be able subsequently to rely on his contract of employment to enforce his statutory rights. In other words, not all illegal acts, even active participation in all illegal acts, will allow the defence of illegality to succeed. Hmm. Going back to the previous sentence, the question in each case is whether there has been a sufficient degree of participation. Well, I, I, sorry, I, I'm not following this. Uh, if there's been a sufficient degree of participation, that gets you into the territory of illegality. But isn't the sentence which mentions coral leisure saying that even if there is sufficient participation, that doesn't necessarily mean <coughs> that all aspects of the contract are unenforceable? Well, I can see I will have to come back to this when we look at coral. What I think he's saying there, the mere performance of some illegal acts 
may not amount to sufficient participation. Well, well I know you're going to come back to it, but if, if in a moment... I take my Lord's no, point. No, no, if, we're going to come to the facts of Hall itself. <clears throat> I mean, how, how could the claimant in Hall make her sex discrimination claim? She, she was a knowing participant. She, she knew about the tax evasion, surely. Well, the, the, remember, Hall is decided on a different basis. Right. Hall, Hall's a sex discrimination complaint. Yes. And the decision of the Court of Appeal is that she didn't require a contract of employment to bring a sex discrimination complaint. In other words, the doctrine of illegality did not bar her from bringing a sex discrimination complaint, as opposed to, for example, an unfair dismissal complaint. Hers was a sex discrimination complaint. Because it's a statutory tort. Exactly. It's a statutory tool, so, and, there's so a Euro and, and there's a European yeah. dimension to it. It may be my fault, Mr. Laddie, but I hadn't appreciated that that was going to be a crucial point of distinction as a matter of legal principle. It's, I, I don't think it arises in this case. The Hall and Wollstone Hall has been regarded as the sort of mothership of uh, guidance in this area of employment law in terms of the doctrine of illegality. It so happens, and I'm not putting it any higher than that, the defence of illegality in Hall and Wollstone Hall failed precisely because it was a sex discrimination complaint, not because it was an unfair dismissal complaint. Notwithstanding that, as we shall see when we come to the second case that I'm going to look at, the observations of the Court of Appeal in relation to common law illegality outside the discrimination context have proved to be of lasting effect. Would it be fair to say that the active participation in the illegal performance is necessary, but not sufficient yes. to make it illegal. Yes, and can I, it's worth saying this as well in relation, because I, having said that this wasn't an unfair dismissal case, it, it, it's, 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 it may be worth making this observation. This case, like so many of the employment cases which one finds in the authorities, are cases which are in some senses unattractive for a tribunal to deal with because they involve a state of affairs set up by the employer who subsequently <coughs> accuses the employee of knowing connivance as a means of defeating the claim. Which is why we tend to have the phrase participation. <coughs> that in itself implies that they're participating with somebody else. Wollstone Hall's a good example. And it may be, had, the, had there been a, a straight unfair dismissal claim, the defence of illegality wouldn't have succeeded there as well because of the disparity of bargaining power, because her participation wasn't sufficient. I don't know, so I'm hypothesising. But you agree with the proposition? Yes, I certainly agree. Active participation is necessary but not sufficient I to render agree. the contract unenforceable. I, I completely agree with the proposition. The next authority is at uh, page 153. Forgive me uh, for, for sticking with Hall. But does, that, it, does it follow from your submissions that what Lord Justice Peter Gibson says at paragraphs 41 and 42 on your submission is simply to be confined to the area of tort law? See, what, what, what interested me, particularly about paragraph 42, is that uh, he appears to suggest that the correct approach of the tribunal, he does say in a sex discrimination case, should be to consider whether the applicant's claim arises out of or is so clearly connected or in <coughs> inextricably bound, linked with the illegal conduct, that the court could not permit the applicant to recover compensation without appearing to condone that conduct. Now, why is that principle confined to tort claims? Why isn't that the, the generic principle? Because isn't that the fundamental public policy rationale that the court should not appear to condone the illegal conduct? And so you look for a causal link. Well, as we shall see when we turn to Patel and Murder, yes. which is the third of the three cases to which I shall refer, the public policy doctrine that lies behind it has, it has been advanced. So with respect, my Lord, I'm not sure how, wh whether I can usefully answer my Lord's questions in circumstances where the Supreme Court has on three occasions more recently than in this case, pronounced on the, precisely that, the public policy dimension. No, I understand that. that, that that's fine. And I don't want to take you out of order at all. But just following on from what my Lord, 
put to you a moment ago, which you accepted, uh, that uh, knowing participation is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the defense of illegality. Fine. But what we then need to know is uh, what is the relevant test for deciding when is it sufficient? Indeed. Um, and, and you're going to come back to that? I'm going to come back. Thank you. Before we leave, um, before we leave this, and in fact, it's to return to my Lord or Justice Baker's question. I'm grateful to Mr. Grees for reminds me of this. Paragraph 47 of uh, Hall, about eight or ten <coughs> lines down, one can see the observation. This isn't one of the sideline passages. At E, there was no active participation by her in the illegality. With the aid of counsel, we've considered whether Mrs. Hall herself was guilty of any illegality under the fiscal legislation or a common law by reason of cheating the public revenue. I've seen nothing that shows that she herself was guilty of any unlawful conduct. Ah. And later on, it's referred to as her acquiescence in the employer's conduct, which is the highest her involvement in the illegality can be. And what do we defer, infer from that? That mere acquiescence is insufficient. Well, uh, I'm having some difficulty understanding this at level of principle. I mean, that may be right. That's what the court said. Fine. And, and we have to apply that. But, but let's suppose that in a sex discrimination <coughs> case, uh, the employee is found to have knowingly participated in the fraud on the revenue. So what? Why should she be prevented from bringing a claim for sex discrimination because of that completely irrelevant illegality, because the criminal law can deal with that. Yeah. I think, that the, I think my, my, my Lord's concerns can be met by saying that in that case it is extremely unlikely that the defence of illegality would succeed, because the law takes the view that there's a distinction in principle, and this may simply be a distinction of convenience rather than anything else, but there is a distinction of principle between claims that are founded on the contract, that's to say statutory employment protection claims relating to dismissal, wages, the like, and those which have a discrimination dimension. In other words, the defense right. of illegality does not succeed. I'm, and I'm speaking, okay. uh, forgive me, uh, partly as a practitioner in this field, yeah. who sees the way that these, the, these cases operate in practice. Discrimination claims are not defeated okay. by defense of illegality. Right. Well, that I understand. See, I, I'm trying to understand what the true principles are. And of course, it's helpful to look at authority. Of course it is, and, and we have to follow binding authority. But I'm just trying to understand what the principles are. So, so move away from the discrimination claim. Right? If you have, say, a claim for wages, and I think some of the cases in the bundle of authorities <coughs> deal with the National Minimum Wage Act. Yes. Right? So let's suppose that somebody is an immigrant, and they have permission to be in this country, uh, but there's a limit on the number of hours they can work. Oh, these right? <coughs> but they work more than that. Now clearly, correct me if I'm wrong, they would not be allowed to sue for the wages for the excess period they're working because they, they've been doing that illegally and the court will not assist someone um, in obtaining remuneration for work they're doing illegally. But does it follow that they can't sue for the work that they have done below the... Uh, uh, condition imposed on their entry leave in this country? If my Lord is asking that as a question of principle, yes. um, I, I, I'm, I have to follow the authority in this case, because it has been considered yeah, in blue chip, yeah. uh, although we, 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 we distinguish blue chip from this case, but in blue chip the conclusion was that in relation to those periods of time when there was a limit imposed, 20 hours per week, the claimant couldn't sue at all for any of his wages for, the, for those periods. He could only sue in respect of those periods where he was permitted to work without restriction. That's to say over the vacation period. But in other words, a distinct, distinct blue chip by Mr Justice Elias, as he then was, between those two parts. Now, I, I, I cannot in good faith say that that follows from a detailed analysis founded on principle. It's 
an example <coughs> of a rough and ready application of where the justice of each case lies, having regard to the countervailing public policy considerations. Follow that somebody could, the employer could fail to pay somebody the minimum wage. Yes. Be and and and, they, and get away with it. Yeah. Because well, well that's an interesting. I mean, we may not have to decide it in this case, but I just want to search for the principle because it, it myself only it doesn't strike me as to be in accordance <coughs> with principle. I might have thought the principle is that the policy of the statute ought to be that people should not be exploited. I, I, I am sympathetic um, to, to my Lord's unsurprising instinctive response. Um, but one can see from the outcome in blue chip mm, yes. that, 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 that the balancing <coughs> act sometimes falls in a way which some might consider to be uh, condoning some degree of exploitation. But is that proportionate? Uh, looking yeah, ahead that's the answer it's regarded as being proportionate and, I, and I, I appreciate of course that the examination of the principles in this case is of critical importance but I must say at the outset <coughs> it doesn't apply in this case because the balance of culpability is so is so one-sided I'm uh, uh, signaling ahead of time what our submissions are going to be in relation to this um, this isn't an exploitation case we say it's quite the opposite well would you like to hazard a proposition of principle Given that you established that, 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 that active participation is necessary but not sufficient to prevent a contract being enforceable, what is, what, what, what would be sufficient? What makes something, what makes participation of a degree sufficient to render it unenforceable? The contract is, is, my, is my Lord inviting me to provide a formula? or a, 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 Can I come back? A point of principle. Yes. Can, can I come back? Because... because I mean, I understand that, it's, that the advocate's role sometimes to, sta to stand on the, to be asked questions on the spot, but I have to observe that this is a question that has defeated tribunals and courts over decades. And when we come to Patel and Mirza, we can see that the discussion in the Supreme Court also in, in, involves operating at a very high level of generality. So, I'm, with respect, I'm not okay. sure that it's possible for me to come up with something more detailed or more precise. Than active participation. I'm, 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 I wish I could. I lack the ingenuity to do so, but I, I don't. I don't regard myself as being alone. The, the, the difficulty, Mr. Laddie, if I may say so, is that as you said a moment ago, and, and very fairly accepted, my lord's point that that's a, that's a necessary condition, but not necessarily sufficient. Can I can I put it to you, and, and, and this may be wrong, which is why we need the assistance of counsel, that there may be something in the proposition. But the causal link point at paragraph 42 in Hall is not, as a matter of principle, confined to tort claims, but that that really gives us an insight into what's really going on here. That there has to be a sufficient <coughs> causal link between the claim that the applicant is bringing and therefore what it is that she is asking the court or tribunal to approve of, and her illegal conduct. So if, if it's got nothing to do with it, then the court might well, even in a contractual case, it might say, fair enough, we're going to let you have that because it's got nothing to do with the, the fact that you committed a speeding offence and you, you're employed to be a driver means that you can be prosecuted for speeding. doesn't mean that you can't sue for your wages. I mean, what's wrong with that as a principled analysis? Not at all, and that goes back to the point. Uh, not, not whatsoever. In fact, when we come to Patel and Mirza, we see uh, Lord Toulson's um, suggestion of factors that may be taken into account when one comes to the third of his trio of considerations, that's to say proportionality. One of the factors is centrality to the contract. So the very question that my Lord has identified is one that is identified as a factor to be taken into account from a proportionality assessment. So I don't, I don't depart from it at all. As the law has developed, the centrality of the illegality to the claim under the con to the claim that's being brought on the contract is indeed part and parcel of the exercise to be conducted. Thank you. Furthermore, and if I if I might just bring it back to, to the facts of this case. In revenue cases, that's to say cases which, are, and so many of the employment cases fall into the category of revenue cases, that's to say 
making sure that the, the correct tax obligations are met, it has always been considered that that is part and parcel, central part and parcel, of the contractual obligations. That's, that's what the authorities show us. When one's looking at cases where we have more peripheral acts of illegality, speeding, parking on a double yellow line, and so on, it's harder to justify <coughs> upholding the defence of illegality in any given case. So if we take <coughs> a different situation, uh, an employer who has um, <coughs> a number of drivers driving his vehicles, <coughs> and he <coughs> tells them all, uh, your job is to get these goods delivered as quickly as possible. I don't want any of this driver's hours business. I want you to get the goods there. All the drivers know that unless they just keep driving, regardless of driver's hours regulations, they are likely to be sacked. Um, <clears throat> in, in an unfair dismissal claim, do you say the issue will be whether that's um, <clears throat> something which can be regarded as central to the particular claim which is being brought. It, it will be a part and parcel of the overall analysis. I mean, of course, the, the tribunal will also want to know, I, I understand that my, my Lord's posing a hypothetical case, mm. the tribunal will also want to know how much pressure was put on the employee to accept this new regime. To what extent was the employee aware of the statutory obligations to limit driver's hours? And critically, what was the response of the employee? Did he protest or did he willingly go along with it? All, all of these are considerations that would have to go into the balance. I mean, one can see, because there are, there are weighty health and safety imperatives, public policy con interests, mm. that would apply to support, if I can put it as crudely as this, the defence of illegality. Mm. You know, drivers sh shouldn't be able to bring claims in circumstances, arguably, and this is only a proposition, where, where they've uh, shown themselves to be reckless as to important restraints on mm. uh, uh, of driving hours made for the purposes of protecting the public. But th 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 yeah. there's room for a, 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 an, a, sure. an infinite array, array of cases. And even and the revenue cases, demons of which are by far the most common in terms of the authorities, demonstrate that the answer isn't always the same. There isn't a single answer. In all revenue cases, the defense of illegality succeeds. That's not the position at all. The, the, the tribunals and the courts have managed to find a way through, distinguishing some cases as cases of sufficient active participation and others, Hall for example, um, reaching the conclusion that the employee either doesn't know or is an unwitting participant or an unwilling participant and so on. All of those cases, of course, far removed from this one. Can I take my lords quickly uh, to the second of the authorities in which I wanted to rely on? That's uh, Enfield Technical Services and also in this court, page uh, 153. This is a case where the defence of illegality, if I can short circuit because the facts are quite complicated, it involves two conjoined appeals. The, the defence of illegality was advanced on the basis of a mischaracterisation of employment status. A case not unlike this one in this respect. Someone claiming to be self employed initially subsequently claiming to be an employee for the purposes of bringing an unfair dismissal claim. The tribunal res resolves the employment status question in the employee's favour, which means that looking back, the representations to, um, to the status uh, under which both parties had assumed they were operating, namely self-employment, proved to be wrong and uh, HMRC had been left out of pocket to a small extent, was that sufficient to found an, um, uh, a def the defence of illegality? 
And can I deal with this briefly? <clears throat> the answer is no. The bona fide disputes about employment status, commonplace as they are, will not found the defence of illegality. There has to be more. And the answer is found in the citation of paragraph 25 of Lord Justice Pill's judgment, page 160, of Mr Justice Elias in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. It's the indented extract. In our judgment, the essential feature of all the cases where there has been found to be illegality is that the parties have knowingly entered into the arrangements which have, to their knowledge, represented the facts of the employment relationship <coughs> to be other than that they really were. There has to be a misrepresentation of the facts to HMRC, I add in parentheses. But by both parties? Uh, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily at all. No. But in a self-employment case, which so many of these are, the, the, the employer, if I can use that term, the employer won't be making any representation to HMRC. It's the, because the representations are made entirely by the employee. The employer won't, not by the worker, the employer won't be saying anything to HMRC because it's self-employed self -employed mm. person. Self-employed person um, says to HMRC, I'm self-employed, takes advantage of the benign expenses regime, and then subsequently brings a claim for unfair dismissal. Now, this is simply a question of mischaracterization of employment status, an innocent one, recognizing that there is room, a lot of room, for a reasonable disagreement as to whether an individual is an employee or self-employed. <coughs> well, well, I see all that. I'm just, just looking at the passage you just cited. The parties have knowingly entered into arrangements which have, to their knowledge, I, I'm not sure there's any significance to that because, of course, there'll be some cases where it's only one party and other cases where both parties are aware of it. A lot of the cases in the authorities are parties I referred to before as <coughs> schemes instituted by the employer, actively connived in by the employee. That's not a, that's not doesn't cover all of them, but a lot of them involve cases where there's knowledge on both sides. Is the misrepresentation sufficient or merely an example of what's necessary? It's uh, merely an example of what's necessary, and very minor misrepresentations, subsequent authorities show, misrepresentation of the facts, very minor mis misrepresentations won't be sufficient. What's very minor in an individual case, uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a rule for this, <coughs> isn't capable of precise calibration. The reason I take my lords to the Enfield case is because I know that what, what in my learned friend's submissions is the repeated point that there was there were complaints on the part of the claimant that there was some manipulation of the tax scheme by the respondent. And it is important to say, one, the tribunal did not find any such deliberate manipulation, and second. In the absence of any such finding of deliberate manipulation, that cannot be held against him. Because essentially, the respondent is just an example of precisely the kind of case discussed in, by the Court of Appeal in the Enfield <coughs> decision, namely, someone who makes a bona fide error, as, it, as it's shown, in relation to employment status. So the, the, the error was between 2014 and 2017, uh, they didn't in fact treat the claimant as being an employee. By, by, by deducting, 
by deducting tax at source? Well, by deducting the appropriate amounts for an employee as opposed to someone who's self-employed. Yes. So that, that was one. As it turns out, yes. with hindsight, in view of the employment tribunal, tribunal fact that, that she was in truth an employee, so retrospectively, one can then see that a bona fide error has been made by the respondent. Um, we should have treated her as an employee, which would have had an effect on, perhaps a marginal effect, but some effect on the amounts deducted. And secondly, it may have led to the consequence that they should, in fact, have been deducting at source by PAYE. Yes. Yeah. Now, if, that, if, that's a, if that's possible, for the respondent, then why isn't the same true of the claimant? That there was a bona fide dispute between them for those three years about the tax position. There can certainly be a bona fide dispute about employment status. I'm not saying it isn't possible there yes. to be a bona fide dispute. But the, the on the tribunal's findings, there wasn't a bona fide dispute about the tax position. That she was to be paid gross. And from 2014 onwards, in order to escape, or rather transfer, the liability that she had already evaded, she falsely claimed that it had always been the position that she would be paid net. So this isn't a bona fide dispute. She, but she, she wasn't in those three years making any false representation to the <coughs> was she? she? Because she was finding her wage packet was actually minus an amount notionally for tax. She wasn't getting the tax. She was making, uh, I mean, I don't know what contact she had with HMRC. The situation is complicated. And the fact that this isn't one of those cases where somebody is involved, engaged in marginal tax evasion, for example, claiming some illegitimate expenses, is, uh, deductible expenses. She wasn't in contact with HMRC at all between 2007 and 2014. There were no representations Subsequently, her contact with HMRC appears to be limited to the employment status question rather than the question of pay. Mm. So this is the difficulty. I, mean, I, I, I don't want to take you out of order at all because you're taking us through the authorities for now. But in due course, certainly speaking for myself, I'm, I'm going to need counsel's assistance on what, what is said to be the illegality on her part between 2014 and 2017? Well, the, 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 my Lord poses the question, what's the illegality between 2014 and 2017? Yes. It creates, in our submission, an illusory watershed at 2014. The claimant avoided meeting her liabilities between 2007 and 2014, and that didn't change in 2014. It's not as if she recanted and suddenly repaid the revenue, the monies that were owing from the previous seven years. She didn't. They remain owing now. We don't accept that it is part and parcel of the correct analysis in this case to identify, as Mr Justice Lewis did in the EAT, or to search for specific illegality. That's our first answer to that. But if we're wrong, and the court isn't satisfied that her continuing liability in relation to the 2007-2014 period amounts to continuing illegality, because the sums, are, the sums were adding up. Sure, they weren't being compounded in relation to 2014-2017 due to the respondents' unilateral deductions. But as I said, her own behaviour worsened, and we would characterise it as illegality. To say she falsely attempted to transfer the liability onto the respondent, and that that is illegality. When she falsely contended that the £34,000 payment, subsequently £37,000, was to be paid net rather than gross. That is fraud. And the fact that it's fraud in plain sight doesn't alter its essential characteristic. Now it's fraud upon the respondent rather than HMRC. 
but it is fraud in relation to a central aspect of the contract, namely the obligation to pay. Furthermore, and I'll come back to this when, when we look at Patel and Mirza, it is centrality or fraud <coughs> directly related to the reason for dismissal. So returning, my lords, to the point that, that my lord Lord Justice Singh was raising as to centrality. In this case, the centrality is obvious. That's to say, the connection between the illegality that we rely on and the claim being advanced by the claimant. One of dismissal. Not just dismissal, I should add, unlawful deduction from wages. That claim as well was predicated upon her case that the 34 slash 37 thousand pounds was a net payment not a gross payment that was false false contention can I can I take my lords now to the third of the cases um, Patel and Mirza um, it's at tab 29 forgive me one moment, it's page 281. It starts at page 281. This is a case where Mr. Patel, it's, a, it's a, in, a, in front of a uh, nine justice constitution of the Supreme Court. This is a case where Mr. Patel lent Mr. Mirza £620,000 to invest in a scheme which would have required unlawful use of insider information. In fact, Mr. Mirza never obtained the inside information and he refused to repay Mr. Patel £620,000 on request. And so there was a claim brought for uh, restitution, stroke unjust enrichment. And the question is whether or not this claim, which obviously related to a, uh, a, 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 a contract that was unlawful in its inception, was defeated by the defence of illegality. In other words, could the court require monies paid by one thief to another? The facts, of course, are very different from, from the facts of this case. Leading judgment given by uh, Lord Toulson, and can I re really take it from page 312 onwards, because there is a magisterial survey of the authorities and the principles in this area to which I, I'm afraid I'm incapable of paying uh, uh, paying justice. Uh, really what I want to do is uh, try and extract from Lord Toulson's speech the relevant principles. And the starting point, I think, is paragraph 99. Looking behind the maxims, there are two broad discernible policy reasons for the common law doctrine of illegality as a defence to a civil claim. One is that a person shouldn't be allowed to profit from his own wrongdoing. The other linked consideration is that the law should be coherent, not self-defeating, condoning illegality by giving with the left hand what it takes from the right hand. At 101, six lines down, there's a, um, there's a sentence that starts in answer to that question. One cannot judge whether allowing a claim which is in some way tainted by illegality would be contrary to the public interest because it would be harmful to the integrity of the legal system without, A, considering the underlying purpose of the prohibition which has been transgressed, B, considering conversely any other relevant public policies which may be rendered ineffective or less effective by denial of the claim, and C, keeping in mind the possibility of overkill unless the law is applied with a due sense of proportionality. We are, after all, in the area of public policy. That trio of necessary considerations can be found in the case law. So 
There are a number of examples then given of cases in which there was a more or less explicit balance of competing public policy considerations. And then at paragraph 107, there is the only attempt made in this judgment to identify the sorts of factors that would be relevant in a proportionality exercise and make it clear Lord Tolson is not purporting to pr provide an exhaustive list of factors. <coughs> 107, in considering whether it would be disproportionate to refuse relief to which the claimant would otherwise be entitled, as a matter of public policy, various factors may be relevant. There's a reference to Professor Burroughs' list, which was referred to earlier in the judgment, but I would not attempt to lay down a prescriptive or definitive list because of the infinite possible variety of cases. Potentially relevant factors include the seriousness of the conduct, its centrality to the contract, whether it was intentional, and whether there was marked disparity in the parties' respective culpability. So four factors given, and I would note, anticipating a point to which I shall uh, in due course return, that contemporaneity, or some temporal connection, between the illegality relied upon and the claim relied upon, is not given as one of the factors, albeit it's of course not expressly excluded. For the sake of completeness, can I just take my, the court's paragraph 100, page 318? Under the heading Summary and Disposal, <coughs> which is, I'm not going to read it out, it binds together <coughs> passages to which we have. Just, uh, which we've just looked at. It's, it's uh, sidelined in red, I hope. C can I just ask you, Ms. Ms. Nadi, who, who is this intended for? Or what's the audience? Is, it, is this an employment tribunal which must then apply these various criteria in each individual case? Or is it that this is the broad sort of thing that, for example, an appellate court should have in mind when it's uh, devising <coughs> rules in a specific area of law? The question um, was an open question after this, after the, after the decision in Patel and Mirza. Yes. Who, who is the audience? And is this trio of necessary considerations to be applied on a rote basis by first instance courts and tribunals? The answer to that question, which I'm going to come to shortly, is no. Yes. But it provides, we say, an extremely useful backdrop. And in any individual case, to stand back and apply the Patel and Merza trio of necessary considerations, and to look at proportionality afresh in any individual case, we say it's a very useful exercise <coughs> to see whether the other tests that have been developed historically, for example, knowledge plus, part active, knowledge plus active participation, to use the employment shorthand, mm -hmm. whether that is still operating effectively whether it's a suitable test, both as a general point and indeed in the individual case. Certainly there's more precision in <coughs> the Patel and Merza formulation than in the knowledge plus active participation shorthand that's been developed in employment cases. But if my Lord is asking, is there required to be a mechanistic application of each of these questions by first instance courts, as we shall see, the answer given by the Supreme Court in subsequent yeah. jurisprudence is no. It's taken me longer than I thought to go through the to outline what we say are the overall principles. Well, that's not a complaint. No, you'll need to include your time estimates if we come back to court. Mr. Yeah, well, I, I'll, 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 I will, I'm engaged in a constant process of cutting my cloth as far as the time estimates are concerned. But before I turn to deal with the specific points arising in this appeal, can I, can I deal with the standard of review? As I said, it's not something which either party has addressed in the papers, but it struck us as being something that is potentially of some importance. What sort of review should be conducted by an appeal court or tribunal when a question of illegality arises? 
And can I say that the law on this is not entirely straightforward or clear? In fact, it's not clear. And there are indicia in different directions. Well, I, I'm not proposing to spend a long time in this, but simply to show the, the court the latest thinking, if I may. And that arises in the decisions of this court and the Supreme Court in the case of Singularis, which, if my, if my lords will take up the, the additional bundle. One will see that, uh, I'm just trying to get to the right page, I'm sorry if you just bear with me a second. It's paragraph 64 to 65 of Sir Geoffrey Voss's judgment in the court of... Page 29. Thank you. I wonder if my lords would read paragraph 64 and 65. dismissed, but there was a further appeal to the Supreme Court where the appeal was again dismissed. If my Lords would turn to Baroness Hale's speech at page 51, please. My Lords read the reservation of view expressed by Baroness Hale at 51, sideline. see that Baroness Hale referred to forthcoming Supreme Court uh, cases concerning illegality. As a matter of chronology, she, she may have been referring to either or both of Henderson which is at, um, and Grondona, which we're going to turn to shortly. Um, but I, I think I'm right in saying that in neither of those two decisions is the standard of review looked at. <coughs> so we're left in a position where we have a um, a reserv an open reservation of view by Baroness Hale, with whom the other justices agree, but um, uh, apparently the ratio of the Court of Appeal in the, uh, as given in the judgment of Sir Geoffrey Voss is that this is uh, essentially, if I can describe it this way, the question of whether the defence of illegality applies is an issue of question of fact, with the ordinary standards of review applicable in those cases. In other words, it's not a question of law to which there's only one answer. That's our starting position. Again, as Baroness Hale observed in relation to the Singularis case, we say it makes no difference in this particular case. I appreciate that this court will be, uh, may be interested in more principled analysis than that. Uh, uh, we are in a position to address the court in more detail as to the, to the various um, indicia in the authorities, but as I say, pointing in different directions as to whether or not it's a question of law or a question of fact. It isn't central to, to the appeal, we say. And I'm conscious that it isn't the way that either party has chosen to present the appeal. And I wasn't, whilst I'm volunteering to, 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 to do the extra legwork in, in relation to this, if the court thinks it would be the assistance, I wasn't proposing to do so orally. Uh, I'm happy to provide some indications of where the, where the authorities lie in different directions. I don't pretend to have more of an answer than emerges from the singularis cases that we've just looked at. The, the, the law, I think it's safe to say, is in a state of a degree of flux. 
this with uncertainty. I, I'm now going to turn, if I may, <coughs> belatedly, my lords may think, to the appeal. Um, we have four grounds of appeal. And conventionally, I, uh, of course, someone in my position would be expected to work through those. But if I may, I'd like to start, in fact, with something that isn't a ground of appeal, but it's meeting the respondent's notice. This is a convenient place to do it. In her appeal to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and then again in the respondent's notice in this court, the claimant's central contention was that the tribunal erred in failing to apply the Patel and Mirza trio of necessary considerations. That was at the forefront of the case presented in the EAT. As I say, it's an argument which I understand still to be before this court. And given the review that we've just undertaken, culminating in Patel and Mirza, it strikes us as being a suitable juncture at which to deal with this point before I come on to our specific four grounds of appeal. And I will need in this context to refer to three post Patel and Mirza decisions, which will also give me the opportunity to illustrate the answer that I gave to my Lord Lord Justice Singh about 15 minutes ago. The first of those authorities is the uh, decision of this court in Okadina and Chikali. <laughs> at page 374 of the authority <clears throat> this is an example of one of those unhappy uh, exploit uh, worker exploitation cases where visa requirements are essentially ignored in the context of domestic staff brought over and made to work in subhuman conditions who subsequently bring claims relating to discrimination on fair dismissal only to find that they're met with an illegality defence. unattractive defence, especially in circumstances of cases such as this, where all of the donkey work in terms of deceiving the authorities was done by the employers. It is important to make the point, and I know that Ms Williams will make the point for me if I fail to make it, that this was an appeal principally concerned with statutory illegality as opposed to common law illegality. defence of illegality that was being advanced was primarily advanced on the basis that the claimant was operating in breach of statute by working at all. But she relied on common law illegality with which we are concerned with in the alternative. In the judgment of the court given by Lord Justice Underhill, the common law illegality issue is dealt at page dealt with at page 382 of our paginated bundles, paragraph 59 onwards. I'm not sure it is a judgment of the court, actually. Forgive me if I've got that wrong. There's a short supplemental judgment from Lord Justice Davis. Yeah. Although the Davis names are spelt incorrectly. Right, well... Anyway, it's not a judgment of the court. Sorry to distract you. But both other Lord Justices entirely agree with it. It's not going out on a limb, to put it that way, Lord Justice Underhill, in relation to this. Uh, but I, I, I accept, of course, the correction, my Lord. I'm sorry about that. So paragraph 59 is where the uh, alternative argument in relation to common law illegality is dealt with. Essentially, the same argument as my learned friend was Below, and as I understand it in this court, was being advanced. Namely, that the, the court, the tribunal, had failed to go through the three step 
patella mirza exercise. Was that an error of law? Paragraph 62 contains the answer. Mr. Reed, who was counsel for the claimant, submitted that it had not been necessary for the tribunal in the facts of this case to carry out an elaborate analysis by reference to the particular factors enumerated. But he also submitted that if it had done so, the result would have been the same. I agree on both points. In his judgment in Patella Mirza, Lord Toulson was attempting to identify the broad principles underlying the illegality rule. His judgment does not require a reconsideration of how the rule has been applied in the previous case law. And I emphasise the following words, except where such an application is inconsistent with those principles. In the case of a contract of employment which has been illegally performed, there is nothing in Patel and Mirza inconsistent with a well-established approach in Hall, just pausing there, that's Wollstone Hall, referred to earlier in the judgment, because there's a review earlier in the judgment of some of the common law illegality employment cases, as regards third category cases. Again, third category cases, just a quick reminder to the court, referred to as third category cases in Hall, these are the cases where contracts become illegal by performance. As Mr. Reid put it, Hall is how Patel and Mirza plays out in that particular type of case. Accordingly, E.T. was quite right to treat its findings about the claimant's knowledge plus participation as conclusive, and the E.T. was right to endorse that approach. Now, Ocadina and Ciccali uh, was decided um, after the decision of the Employment Tribunal in this case, but before the decision of the Employment Appeal Tribunal. My learned friend contended that Ocadina and Ciccali should be read narrowly, a proposition with which Mr Justice Lewis disagreed in the EAT. She made the fair point, as I say, that the case was principally concerned with statutory illegality. But any doubt about the correctness of Mr Justice Lewis's assessment of the binding character of Ocadina and Ciccali is um, dismissed by the way that the matter has subsequently been dealt with in two Supreme Court decisions. The first of those is the decision in Henderson and Dorset Healthcare, see page 398 of the authorities bundle. a case where admitted negligence in terms of provision of medical care by the defendant's trust <coughs> to the claimant predated and said the claimant caused or contributed to her subsequently stabbing to death her mother during a psychotic episode. <coughs> and suffering the criminal law consequences of that act. The defendant trust deployed a defence of illegality in relation to their admitted negligence. Obviously it's a case far removed from this one. It's a case that's in, based in tort rather than contract. albeit the principle of common law illegality does not recognise that as a distinct <coughs> significance. There is a detailed discussion, discussion by Lord Hamlet of how Patel and Mirza is to be applied. And can I invite the court please to turn to page 417. I should say at the outset that the defence of illegality succeeded at all stages. So at page 417, paragraph 74 first of all, first it should be emphasised that Patel concerned common law illegality rather than statutory illegality, where the effects of the illegality are dealt with by statute, then the statute should be applied. 75, 
there is then a reference to Lord Justice Underhill's judgment in Ocadena in Chicago. Seventy six. Secondly, Patel concerns a claim in unjust enrichment, but there can be little doubt that it was intended to provide guidance as to the proper approach to the common law illegality defence across civil law more generally. Maybe that gives some assistance in terms of my Lord or Justice Singh's question, who's the audience? Everyone's the audience, I think, is the answer to that. But there are limits to that, as one can see from paragraph 77. That does not mean that Patel represents year zero, that, it, that, that in all future illegality cases it is Patel and only Patel that is to be considered and applied. That would be to disregard the value of precedents built up in various areas of the law to address particular factual situations giving rise to the illegality defence. Those decisions remain of precedential value unless it can be shown that they are not compatible with the, uh, with the approach set out in Patel in the sense that they cannot stand with the reasoning in Patel or were wrongly decided in the light of that reasoning. Lord Toulson, JSC, made it clear in Patel that the principles he identified were to be found in the existing case law. The paragraph references are then given. This is well illustrated by the decision of the Court of Appeal in Ocadena in Chicali. In employment law, the touchstone for the availability of the defence of common law illegality to employee claims has long been recognised as being whether the employee has knowingly participated in the illegal performance of the contract, as stated in the Court of Appeal decision in Hall and Wilson Hall Leisure. In Ocadena and Chicali, that approach had been followed by the Employment Tribunal and the Employment Appeal Tribunal. It was submitted on appeal, this was inadequate, and the matter should have been addressed by going through the Patel trio of considerations. The Court of Appeal rejected the submission that it was necessary for the Tribunal on the facts of this case to carry out an expert analysis. <coughs> in reference to particular factors enumerated, uh, and although the words I agree do not appear, that is the necessary tenor of the way that that's dealt with. I should finally um, take the court to Grondona and Stoffel, another Supreme Court decision on the vexed question of illegality. If it, if it was thought that Patel and Mirza might might <laughs> to draw the curtains on it, I'm afraid they had another think coming. Um, but Grondona and Stoffel is at page 430. Very briefly, the facts of Grondona and Stoffel. The claimant entered into an unlawful agreement with a third party by which she, she would obtain a mortgage uh, which she would then effectively uh, assign, the they assi assign the benefit of the mortgage uh, to him. Uh, that was an unlawful arrangement. She subsequently sued her solicitors for professional negligence in relation to their subsequent failure to register the title of the properties conveyed that ought to have been conveyed to her. Plainly, the solicitors were negligent, but they raised the defence of illegality in relation to her prior agreement with the third party to effectively commit a, a, a form of mortgage fraud. That defence of illegality failed. <coughs> Before I, I turn to the relevant passages, I should note that this case is an example of there being a disjunction in temporal terms between the illegality, which was the entering into of the agreement with the third party, and the act of negligence on which the claim was based, which postdated it. And although the defence of illegality failed, it didn't fail because of any such temporal dis disjunction. Indeed, it's worth observing that the Henderson case that we just looked at also involved the temporal disjunction, albeit in that way it was the other way around. In that case, it was the other way around. You have the negligence of the trust first, and the illegality was a later act of the claimant. Again, a disjunction of timing 
was not a relevant consideration in holding that the, that the defence of illegality should succeed. <clears throat> the only part of the decision of the of decision in Grondona and Stoffel um, that, that I want to refer to is at paragraph 26 on page 439. This is the speech of Lord Lloyd Jones. I think this is the decision of the court. But paragraph 26 at 439. It's important to bear in mind when applying the trio of necessary considerations described by Lord Toulson and Patel, they are relevant not because it may be considered desirable that a given policy should be promoted, but because of their bearing on determining whether to allow a claim would damage the integrity of the law by permitting incoherent contradictions. Equally, such an evaluation of policy considerations, while necessarily structured, must not be permitted to become another mechanistic process. Uh, and I wasn't proposing to read the rest of it uh, aloud, but my lords can see where we've sidelined the passage, which in a sense echoes the observations made by Lord Hamblin in the Henderson case, which we just looked at. Patel and Mirza doesn't represent year zero. Now, I don't know whether the claimant in this case is continuing to pursue the contention that it was an error of law for Patel and Mirza, the trio of considerations, not to be formally applied by the Employment Tribunal. I note that neither the Henderson decision nor the Grondona and Stoffel decision are cited in my learned friend's skeleton argument. I wait to see how Ms Williams deals with this point uh, when she gets to her feet. If it is a point which he is taking, I will say that it is re it is definitively answered by the decisions of uh, the Court of Appeal in Okavina and Chicali, and then more obviously by Henderson and by Guandona. I'm not going to say any more than that. But it does provide, in my submission, a useful opportunity for the respondent, and indeed the, the court, to ask, well, what would the answer be in this case, if in fact the tribunal had undertaken the mechanistic task of applying the trio of necessary considerations. Let's just put Ocadina, etc., to one side and just apply Patel and Mirza. And it will be recalled that is an exercise which is permissible to see whether the established authorities, the established principles based upon decades of precedential value, conflict with the principles in Patel and Mercer. And so we propose, we invite the court to undertake that exercise. We're going to go through the trio of, necess of necessary consideration. I'll do so pretty briefly, because in my submission, the answer that it reveals is crystal clear in terms of the facts of this case. This is a paradigm case for the application of the illegality principle, the, or for permitting the illegality defence to succeed. <clears throat> First, what is the underlying purpose of the provision that has been transgressed? <clears throat> uh, I, I'm being no tax lawyer, I can't identify with precision the statutory, uh, um, uh, the, with precision the, the particular statutory provision that provides for payment of tax. But I, I'm not sure that's necessary. Plainly, the public policy considerations underpinning the collection of revenue from work, tax revenue from work, are of paramount importance. They ensure that basic welfare is available to all. They ensure that the kingdom is protected. They ensure that there is a justice system, free to access, more or less, available to all, and a host of other matters. All of these 
incidence of a functioning state depends upon the collection of tax. That's question one, the trio of necessary considerations. <coughs> Two, are there any countervailing public policies that may be rendered less effective by denial of the claim? We recognise that there is a public policy in the protection of employment relationships that requires that employment relationships cannot be terminated <coughs> willy-nilly at the whim of the employer and that there ought to be safeguards. We recognise that these two policies may conflict in this case, which is why that this is a case to go to the third of the trio of necessary, con necessary considerations, which is the balancing exercise, proportionality, how does it play out? I'm going to start, if I may, by simply going through the, the factors identified by Lord Toulson at paragraph 107 of his judgment. Those are the factors that he suggested might be relevant in a proportionality exercise. Factor one, the seriousness of the conduct. This is extremely serious. There was complete evasion of tax for seven years. Thereafter, there was a fraud perpetrated upon the, uh, upon the respondent. There has at no stage been any attempt by the claimant to repay the monies that she has pocketed and should have been given over to, the, to HMRC. There's reference in the authorities, I'm looking at the employment authority specifically, to the case, to cases of illegality succeeding where the scale of the uh, uh, misrepresentations placed upon the inland revenue are relatively modest, a few hundred pounds a year. It's the Cathcart back of the envelope calculation back in 20, 2014 placed the loss of the revenue between 50 and 100,000 pounds. And it's important to recognise that in so ignoring the penalty element of that, this is money that should have been paid to the revenue, but which has been retained by the claimant. So we say this is extremely serious misconduct, not at the margin. Second, centrality to the contract. And, and in that context, I'm, looking at the, I'm also looking at this from the, from the point of view of connection with the claim. I made the point earlier that payment of tax has long been regarded as an incident of performance of the employment contract. That broad proposition applies even in the case of self-employed people. So, so, so in, in order to avoid taking an unduly semantic or technical approach to this, someone who believes or represents they're self-employed isn't working under an employment contract. If they subsequently claim uh, ex post facto that they are an employee in order to bring claim of unfair dismissal, even whilst they were <coughs> contending to the revenue that they were self-employed, they were still under an obligation to make appropriate provision for tax. We say that, that the tax is centrally connected to the obligation to pay and the entitlement to receive pay under a contract for work. What about the fraud perpetrated by the claimant on the respondent? That's just as central to the contract because it's a fraud about pay. At its heart, an employment contract is an exchange of labour for wages. <clears throat> so one can hardly imagine an example of illegality more central to the contract than the fraud perpetrated by the claimant on the respondent. The third of the factors suggested by Lord Tulsa, was it intentional? 
pausing there, it is interesting. But in the broader scheme of common law illegality post Patel and Mirza, there appears to be room for the doctrine to be the, for the defence to to fly, even in cases where the conduct was unintentional. Remembering, of course, that the bar is higher in employment cases because the requirement of knowledge plus active participation would appear to exclude cases of unintentional illegality. In any event, in this case, the claimant's conduct could hardly be anything but intentional. These are the findings of the tribunal. They found that she deliberately evaded paying tax up to 2014, and that when she contended to the respondent that in fact she was to be paid net, she knew that not to be the case. <coughs> Fourth, the fourth and final factor identified by Lord Tolson, the disparity, any disparity in the parties' respective culpability. Well, unlike in many employment cases, no culpability in our submission, none at all, can be attached to the respondent. He was entirely ignorant and blameless in the years 2007 to 2014. He assumed that the claimant was paying her taxes as had been contractually agreed. Furthermore, when he found out it was him who, contacted, who first contacted HMRC, he took steps going forward to ensure that HMRC would not be deprived of its taxes, paragraph 59, the non-compounding. And he insisted, and we regard this as a feather in his cap, not as a stick to beat him with, that the claimant correct her outstanding and historic liability as a condition of continuing her employment. The claimant's case that he shared or bore some culpability rests entirely upon a case that failed before the Employment Tribunal, namely to suggest that there was some deliberate ma manipulation of the tax codes and the tax schemes in order to protect him from paying, uh, from being responsible for payment of taxes in relation, not so much to her, but more to staff more generally. That was a case that was not made out. And as we've seen from the Enfield decision, mis bona fide miscategorization of employment status <coughs> isn't uh, to be held at the, uh, isn't to be regarded as an incident of culpability. Are there any other factors not referred to by Lord Toulson that may apply in this case? I've, I've made the point already, but I it is worth repeating. The dismissal in this case, and indeed the deduction from wages about which the claimant complained, were directly related to the illegality. This isn't one of those cases where the dismissal is in relation to X and is completely unjustifiable, and the employer relies on a historic, unrelated incidence of illegality. The two are intimately connected in this case. And further, the dismissal was not substantively unfair only procedural. Application of the factors identified in Patel and Mirza as a sounding board or a checking device to test the employment tribunal's conclusion in this case in particular, but also to test more generally whether the knowledge plus participation maxim which the employment tribunal applied provides a safe answer, at least in the context of this case, the answer to that question is yes. If this isn't an appropriate employment case for the application of the illegality defence, it is hard in my submission to see what kind of case might be. Mr Laddie, as I understand it, this part of your submission, 
does not depend on anything that happened after 2014. Suppose, for example, hypothetically, uh, shortly <coughs> after the respondent learnt that the claimant had not been paying tax due for the last seven years, so in 2014, uh, he dismissed her. I, your, your case, as you've just presented it in the last few minutes, would be exactly the same, wouldn't it? No. No? No. There'd be one difference. Ah, okay. And the difference lies in the fraud upon the respondent. Yes, I see. But, 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 but I don't think your <coughs> submission depends on that, actually. So, uh, it, absolutely. No. So, in other words, if the clock stopped at 2014, yeah. if his response in 2014 yeah. was, say, was to dismiss her, absolutely. Yeah. But, but, so I just want to test whether, whether you're right, whether Mr Justice Lewis was right. One might be able to test who's right on, that, on your submission by saying, let's stop the clock yep. in 2014. And why does it make any difference then that the dismissal took place three years later? That will be part <coughs> of my submissions when we come to the, which I'm about to yes, directly, we come to the way that Mr Justice Lewis dealt with it. Yes, yes. Um, well, well, just before you come to that, um, help me if you would, please, <coughs> and a bit more about this, this fraud. Yeah. W what do you say the fraud is? Uh, if, if my law picks up the, the additional bundle of that the additional bundle of authorities. I know there's a danger of me teaching your grandmother to suck eggs in relation to this. We've included, we've included the Fraud Act. Um, <coughs> section 2. It's, <coughs> it's a fraud by false representation. Sorry, where is it? So, I'm so sorry. It's, it's it, in the supplemental bundle. Oh, yeah, I, I see Section uh, 2 1. Yeah. Hmm. But, but, but it, it's not wholly unfamiliar to me, as, as, <laughs> as you suggested. Um, and I just want to know what, what it is you're saying is, is the factual misrepresentation yeah. here. I, I, is it the assertion that, that you promised to pay me 34000 after? Deduction of all the taxes. Yes, yeah, knowing that to be false. Right. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely, that is correct. Well, in fact, by the time the representation is made, it's by then thirty-seven thousand pounds net, because of the pay rise that had happened in the in the intervening period. Just to get my my, my lord looks puzzled. Two thousand and seven was the commencement of the contract. Yeah. To, at that point, the pay was thirty-four thousand pounds. We say gross. In two thousand and nine, there was a pay rise to thirty-seven thousand. So the representation was made, what we say, the, the false representation was made between 2014, 2007, in, in 2017, indeed subsequently, to the employment tribunal, who rejected it. All right. If you look at subsection two, representation is false, A and B, and B is the person making it knows that it is, or might be, untrue or misleading. There must be hardly any contractual dispute in the world where somebody might not be said to know that something may turn out to be untrue. Maybe, but that um, that may be so. But that's not a, a, a sufficient consideration. One looks at paragraph at section two one a. There's a requirement of dishonesty. Yes, so that's the critical phrase. Understood. Yeah, so but it's not knowing that it's false. It's, it's me. Making it dishonest. Absolutely. It's, it's has, has there been a finding in the present case no. that she said this dishonestly? No, but this isn't. This isn't a criminal case. But it's implicit. It's impossible in my submission to read the tribunal's findings in any other way. There is a dispute of, on the evidence as to whether or not it was thirty-four thousand pounds or thirty-seven thousand pounds. The tribunal finds that the claimant coughs up to Mr. Cathcart in twenty fourteen. She hasn't paid tax for seven years. She says, I was paid cash. The tribunal makes a finding of fact. She says it in circumstances that connote I'm being paid under the table. But of course, it would be, be absolutely clear. So there's no mistake. Can we just look at that, do you think, in the ET's findings? You're, you're paraphrasing what the ET found. Yeah, by, by all means. For my part, it would help but to see exactly, since this seems to be central to your argument exactly how the finding of the ET brought um, uh, 
her conduct within fraud as defined in the, in the statute you've taken to two. Yeah, can I, I'm, I'm, I, I totally accept the, the, the invitation. I will take my, my, law, my laws to the, to the findings. I'm, I'm not pretending that the Fraud Act was put before the Employment no. Tribunal. It wasn't, we didn't take the view that it was required right. sensibly or otherwise. It, we're not, you're not going to find in this decision an express independent sentence saying this amounts to an... But you rely on the, the fraud, is, 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 you, you've used it, never mind the act. The, the word the fraud, as you've characterised it, is central to your submission, isn't it? No. Because it extends the illegality. No. The, no, it, it doesn't with respect. With respect. I'm grateful for the opportunity. The illegality doesn't stop in 2014 because the claimant remained under an obligation which she failed to meet to pay her taxes from 2007 to 2014. <coughs> if she'd repaid them in 2014, then I might understand how the illegality had ceased, but it didn't cease, just ignoring the, the false representation. Illegality in relation to non-payment of taxes continued. And it's continued to this day, it hasn't changed. That's why I used the expression earlier on, 2014 is an illusory watershed. But we say, in addition, her illegality worsened because of what, because her mechanism for evading the tax changed in 2014 from simply keeping quiet about it and hoping the revenue never picked up on her to saying falsely to the respondent, actually, despite what the letter in 20, 2007 says, you, you always agreed right. to pay me okay. that. Does, does my Lord have a point? And just so I want to, I'd, I'd like to look at that passage in the ET. Yeah. Decision, but but if it was if the fraud wasn't there, your point is your, your, it is your case that the the illegality, the continuing illegality you described it by not paying the tax was central to the claim to adopt Lord Tulson's third factor. C correct, but 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 I but I go further even than that, my lord. Even if the court was satisfied that. The continuing failure to pay to pay from 2014 historic taxes from 2007 to 14 wasn't an example of illegality in performance of the contract. The scale and seriousness of the 2007 to 2014 illegality was such that the defence of illegality ought to have been permitted in 2017. In other words. The passage of time between 2014 and 2017 did not alter the position as far as a, we say a contra the contract was unenforceable in 2014, unenforceable at the claimant's suit because of her illegality. Nothing changed in the claimant's favour between 2014 and 2017 to alter that position. So this argument would be the same if you hadn't been dismissed until last week. It's a, it's a fair point. It, we, we, I was, I'm taking this slightly out of order. Um, but we wondered, Mr Greaves and I, um, whether in fact the position as a matter of principle is that once a contract is unenforceable at a given party suit, can it ever subsequently become enforceable again, merely through a fluxion of time? And we haven't found any authority to suggest that an unenforceable contract can subsequently become enforceable again through a fluxion of time. However, having said that, so I should add as well, there are some authorities, Coral and Barnett is one in fact, which suggest that once unenforceable, always unenforceable. But we actually think that that would be inconsistent with the gist of Patel and Mirza. And we don't want to make an unrealistic suit. Well, supposing she'd had <clears throat> one year of not, and not seven years, yeah. and then 15 years. Exactly. It's, a good, it, it, it's precisely that kind of example. Um, or exceeded the driver's hours in 2004. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. In some cases... So, so perhaps no authority, but, but perhaps um, nonetheless some uh, common sense reasons why Indeed. The, the extreme proposition looks unlikely. Good. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad that Although I, that I does... didn't pursue the purest position. There. <laughs> 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 Sorry, you were getting, just going to have to tell, tell me where the passage is. I guess. Uh, uh, I don't want to take up time. It's where, 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 where the ET judgment, the passage of the ET judgment, which demonstrates, which um, 
lead you to make the submission about fraud. Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, ha having prefaced that, having prefaced that with um, uh, my point that it's not a necessary part of my submissions, but it is, but it is a, a component of my submissions. Under the heading tax investigation on two two five, the tribunal details deals in detail with the conversation with Mr. Pack. Thirty nine to forty five are the critical findings. And, that, and if I may pay tribute to the tribunal, they recognise the importance of these findings, <laughs> and hence the time and care lavished between thirty nine and forty five on establishing the facts. This was at the core of the evidential dispute between the parties. That, has to, that can't be read in isolation. I'd also invite the court to read to have regard to paragraph 18 on page 220, where the tribunal explains its reasons for preferring the claim, the respondent's case rather, to the claimant's case on the question of the term of remuneration. It's paragraph 18 on page 220. My lords will note that a number of the subparagraphs at 18 <coughs> refer to doubts about the claimant's credibility. And the the, um, the the 2014 fraud, where, where are the findings about that? So it, you, you won't find an, ex, an express provision because my lord will recall that the, the, the term dispute about remuneration, whether it was net or gross, is dealt with at paragraph 18 and also in, in parts between paragraphs 38 and 43. It's dealt with as a separate preliminary part of the employment tribunal's findings. Then when the tribunal starts dealing with the protected disclosures, see for example paragraph 61, page 231, in the context of the third disclosure, if my lords look at the last line, last two lines, Paragraph 61. Importantly, it's the first time the claimant was explicit that the respondent should pay her tax in addition to £37,000 per annum. Now, just pausing there, the tribunal doesn't go on to say that's a false claim because it had already reached its finding of fact, paragraph 18, as to what the contractual term of remuneration was. And reading this document fairly, Nobody could read this as saying that there was um, an entirely understandable um, mis uh, misunderstanding or non-meeting of minds between the claimant and the respondent as to what the term of remuneration was. As the tribunal found at paragraph 18, it was clear what the term of remuneration was and the claimant knew it. Accordingly, it's impossible, we say, to read this as being anything other than a finding that the claimant acted dishonestly in trying to shift the blame onto the, uh, sorry, shift the liability yeah. onto uh, the respondent. Uh, I appreciate it's not found in those terms. No, no. Well, but I'm not really looking for it in those terms. What, what, what I'd like your assistance with, please, is where in the judgment of the ET do they deal with the, the factual matter as to what was said when 
uh, to the effect that the thirty-four stroke thirty-seven thousand pounds was the the figure payable net after deduction of all taxes. I, I'm sort of not sure. I'm, I'm sure it's my fault. I'm, I'm not sure I follow what, what I'm being asked to do. Right. You, 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 an important submission you make <coughs> is that after twenty fourteen, the claimant made matters worse yeah. by advancing a new proposition. The agreed figures were <coughs> the net figures after y y you, Your Highness, had deducted all yeah. tax and, and outgoings. And I, I just want to pin down, please, where in the judgment of the ET they deal with the facts relating to that assertion. Uh, well, for example, here at paragraph 61. But, but 61's <coughs> talking about 2007. Y y your argument, as I've understood it, is that something happens in or after no. 2014. No, no, I'm, forgive me, my, my Lord's wrong about that. Because paragraph 61 is under the heading third disclosure. This is a communication dated the 9th of July 2014. So, so is, this the, is this the false representation? Yes. The letter of the 9th of July? Uh, exactly. So uh, it, the letter of 9th of July 2014 is... The tribunal points out that even though the claimant had six months before told Mr. Cathcart she hadn't paid the tax, it was the 9th of July 2014 when she alit for the first time on the suggestion that actually she, her pay was always supposed to be net. So th this is fraud by causing her tax advisors to write a letter putting forward a a dishonest and false claim. Yes. That it? And then... W w was that submission made to the tribunal? It was... Did I refer to section <coughs> two of the... No, no, I'm not... I'm, yes. whether, whether anybody referred to that or not. Yes. It was undoubtedly put that her situation was aggravated. Was it put that it was dishonest? Yes. I cross-examined her on the basis it was dishonest. So the word dishonesty was... Um, used in the course of the hearing, but doesn't appear in the final uh, But In fact, before being careless in terms of my answer, I think it would be sensible for me to return to my skeleton argument, which isn't in the bundle. So I can do that over the adjournment. Yeah. Just see how I put it in the skeleton argument. Yes. Uh, uh, rather than um, overreaching. But there it's isn't an express finding of dishonesty in this decision. No, no, and there isn't an express finding of dishonesty in relation to the taxes either the non-payment of taxes. It doesn't say she dishonestly did so. But, what it, but, but with respect, it's the, the appeal courts are constantly reminded when it comes to decisions of employment tribunals, they shouldn't go through them with a fine tooth comb. Reading this fairly, okay. in the context, and I should make this absolutely clear, this is in the context of a civil doctrine, common law illegality. There isn't an obligation for us to prove dishonesty or, or to meet the criminal statute to, fu to, to fulfil them. Our overall submission here is one. Let's look at the common ground first. No one appears to be in a, in a contending that if the dismissal had taken place on the 31st of January 2014, that it would have been that the defence of illegality would have succeeded. Mr. Justice Lewis certainly accepted that proposition, as we'll see shortly. I don't understand my learned friends to be contending otherwise. So, did anything happen? in the subsequent period of time, including a fluxion of time per se, to change the position. And our position is it got worse because of what we call the fraud. In any event, the illegality didn't cease because she still didn't pay back the monies in relation to 2007 and 2014. Nothing else occurred to, to, to improve the claimant's position unless one looks at mere fluxion of time. Now, there may be some cases, my Lord's one year is illegality, 15 years passage of time, but that would be a good point. But here, the common ground on illegality was that it lasted seven years. You then have three years where the respondent is saying, get your tax affairs in order. Latterly, I'm going to dismiss you or terminate your contract if you don't. <coughs> it's not one of those cases. You did say a few moments ago, Mr. Laddie, that the Employment Tribunal did find that the claimant had deliberately failed to pay the tax due. 
yeah. between 2007 and 2014. Can you just remind us of where that finding of deliberately is? Yeah, I think the word deliberate may be yeah, it's last line of paragraph 45 on 227. And this was really the point of departure, as I understand it, for Mr. Justice Lewis, that, that uh, uh, I think his rationale is, or his reasoning is, uh, there is, there can be no dispute that the claimant did act unlawfully vis-a-vis -vis the revenue in the period 2007 to 2014. Is that right? Yes. And, and, and in, in a sense, although you make lots of other submissions, and I can understand forensically why you do so, your, your central complaint, I think, about Mr. Justice Lewis's judgment is that he uh, then wrongly thought that something material had changed because of uh, the passage of time uh, by the time of dismissal. And, and one way of testing that is, what if you stop the clock in 2014? Would the defence of illegality have been available at that time? You say clearly it would. And even Justice Lewis finds as much. Quite, quite. And, and also you say that nothing material had changed. Uh, to the contrary, and I, I help you with this, does Mr Justice Lewis ever refer to the fact that there is in fact a continuing <coughs> obligation on the part of a taxpayer to continue the, sorry, to pay the back tax. No. In other words, even if, let's suppose I was in this position, I'm the taxpayer, and I see the error of my ways, and in 2014 I start paying my tax. So there's no need for a separate account. I start paying my tax. But is it your submission that actually there is a continuing legal obligation to pay the back tax? No, it doesn't disappear. What's happened no. to it? And, and <clears throat> that may or may not be relevant to the uh, availability of a defence of illegality even in 2017, you say? Well, I say it is relevant. Right. Uh, and that this case falls to be distinguished from one where the claimant didn't merely confess to Mr. Kafka of 2014, <coughs> but she also made remedied, so far as she was able to do so, the non-payment of taxes. In fact, far from remedying, she just switched, she, she just sought to transfer the liability to the respondent. But in a sense, that's a bolt-on. I don't even need that argument. Even, even assuming that we don't, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole of whether or not we can identify a finding of dishonesty vis-a-vis -vis the Fraud Act in the tribunal's judgment. I accept you can't. Even ignoring all of that, the, claimants, the claimant didn't pay back her taxes. She is, therefore, her case is to be distinguished from one, say, this is an analogy that we draw in our skeleton argument of a contemnor purging his contempt. She doesn't do that. And the only reason that the situation vis-a-vis -vis the revenue changes in 2014 is not because of anything done by the claimant, it's because it's the respondent who takes responsibility for subtracting sums from her, her from her weekly or monthly pay, uh, pay back. If I can just make what I promise will be my final um, interruption uh, on this fraud point. Um, do, do you want to say anything about the second half of paragraph 99 of the Employment Tribunal's judgment? Of the Tribunal judgment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, page 242. Well, I I'm grateful to my lawyer for pointing that out. I mean, that Again, the word dishonesty isn't used, but the tenor of that <coughs> passage is that the claimant knew when representing the respondent, claiming to the respondent, 
that she should be paid net. She knew that it wasn't that was an entitlement which she did not in fact have. Mm. And I, I should but, say, but, but, sorry. But, um, sorry to interrupt you. No, not at all. Um, but, but in the sentence in the middle of the paragraph, beginning when there was a conversation about tax in 2014. She did not assert there had been an agreement to pay net and the promise to set up PAYE later. Despite the issue running from then on, did not say so until much later, and even then said only that she assumed pay was net of deduction, not that she was told so. That's a reference to an earlier finding in the context of protected disclosures. So what the tribunal is there doing is pointing <coughs> out that her story in relation to her account, in relation to the net claim was late and then when it was made inconsistent which then links back to paragraph 18 of the tribunal's findings with all its observations about the claimant's credibility as to why the term was in fact gross rather than net. Yeah. So, so you rely on really the, the, the final sentence of that paragraph? Yeah it's, it's <coughs> yes I, I do but also the judgment read as a whole. And I, 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 yeah, it, is, it is apparent I, I can't I'm not going to overreach in relation to the tribunal judgment the key issue for the tribunal was the non-payment of taxes between 2007 and 2014. It did not give the claimant's false representation the weight to give. Neither it, it's it's not prominent in the tribunal's thinking. But if we remember, remembering that this analysis is taking place against the backdrop of my invitation to the court to apply Patel and Merza. Formulaically. And if one does this exercise from the point of view of what changed, if, if the common ground is it's illegal in 2014, the, the defence of illegality would have succeeded in 2014, what could have changed between 2014 and 2017? I, although I don't need to demonstrate that the claimant's behaviour got worse because she also made a fraud or in, engaged in a fraud against the respondent, I can't ignore that, the fact that on the tribunal's findings it appears that that's what she did. May not satisfy a jury to the criminal standard, but that's also not the test in this in this arena. Um, I'm conscious of the time, and I'd quite like to deal with the way that well, our first ground of appeal, in fact. <laughs> uh, my lords will be pleased to hear that through traversing this, the, 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 the territory we have over the course of this morning. It will have short-circuited to some degree, um, the, to a significant degree in fact, the detail of which I'll need to go into the submissions in relation to the individual grounds of appeal. But in, in the 20 minutes available to me before the short adjournment, I wonder if I can deal with our first ground of appeal. And this is what, what we've called an error of law because we say that Mr Justice Lewis, uh, I hope I'll be forgiven for calling you Mr Justice Lewis, given his subsequent promotion, uh, what the EAT um, we say they, they, there was an error of law in that, they, in that in a, there was an application of the so-called principle of contemporaneity. That if there wasn't an equivalence of timing between the by the claimant, dismissal of deductions from wages, on the one hand, and the illegality on which the respondent relies, on the other, an illegality, the defence of illegality couldn't, couldn't be made out. And in this context, it is crucial in my submission to understand the way that my learned friends are, are running their case on this. They say that we are just wrong. That is not what Mr Justice Lewis did at all. There doesn't appear to be a supplementary argument being run by uh, Ms Williams to the effect that if that is what Mr Justice Lewis did, then it was permissible. So what I propose to do is to take the court through the Employment Appeal Tribunal judgment in order to identify the answer to the question, did the Employment Appeal Tribunal treat contemporaneity as a requirement of the defence of illegality? First, the, the Employment Appeal Tribunal judgment is found, it starts at page 116, and I'm, I have no doubt that the court's read it already. It's worth making this point as by way of opener. As a matter of structure, when dealing with the defence of illegality, 
The Court of Appeal judgment is structured in two EAT, parts. EAT judgment. Ah, oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. You mean, that's what you mean, EAT? You mean. Sorry. If I can say I'm sorry. It's structured. It's structured in two parts. 2007 to 2014. Please see page 161. And then the period 1 July 2014 to 9 May 2017. Quite a few things happened in 2014, so it may be worth just reminding ourselves of 1 July 2014. That's the date that the respondent started making deductions. The deductions were prospective. In other words, they were to meet the prospective tax liability, not the historic established tax liability. And they were done, forgive me for repeating myself, in order to not compound the situation. Paragraph 59 of the tri Employment Tribunal. My Lords will note, it's not necessary to read 88 to 91 in full for these purposes. <clears throat> the 88 to 91 is where Mr Justice Lewis deals with the Ocadina and Chicali points. And my lords will note that in the final sentence of paragraph 90, <coughs> the finding is, thirdly and separately, on the facts of this case, there were no other circumstances relevant to the period 2007 to 1 July 2014, which could, on any analysis, have led to a different conclusion. So in other words, what the EAT is finding, we don't, we, we don't disagree with this at all, is that if you stop the clock on the 1st of July 2014, then the defence of illegality succeeds. And it would be, in fact, on the EAT's conclusion, any other conclusion would be perverse. And then he goes on as follows, paragraph 91. The difficulty with the Employment Tribunal's decision on the issue of illegality arises out of its consideration of the period after 1 July 2014. Plainly, the EAT considers that 1 July 2014 is a threshold. The claimant was not dismissed once the illegality for which she was responsible came to light. She was employed for a further three years. suggest that a principle of contemporaneity was being applied, that point is made stronger by paragraph 95. Sorry, not, did I say 95? I meant 94. I beg your pardon. In the present case, the employment tribunal did not consider or identify the illegal conduct in which the claimant knowingly participated after 1 July 2014, which would disentitle her from being able to enforce the contract. In other words, in order for the defence of illegality successfully to be deployed, the respondent would have to identify illegal conduct in which the claimant knowingly participated after 1 July 2014. That's the principle of contemporaneity in action. I'm sorry, but what does contemporaneity mean? It means that there, uh, it, it, it's, it's, we've, we've, we've coined this. It means it's a principle which is being, we say, invented by the EAT in this case and applied to the effect that unless there is a coincidence of timing between the illegality relied upon by the respondent and the claim advanced by the claimant, then the defence of illegality cannot succeed. In other words, there has to be illegality all the way up to the dismissal. Where, at the time of the dismissal. And where is that principle founded? I'm, I'm, I'm inferring its application from, from one, the way that the judgment is structured, to the very words of paragraph 94. Like at this point, at 94 and 95, uh, Mr Justice Lewis is considering the, what, the, what the employment tribunal did or did not address. Yes, I, I, I was going to deal with paragraph 95. I'm, I'm taking this in, 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 yes. in order, my lord. A paragraph 95 but, but, but that doesn't, you're, you're saying that by putting it that way, it's in, he's, he's indicating what was required, are you? 
Yeah, he's saying what's uh, that's our primary submission is that it's being elevated into a requirement. But even if I'm wrong, even if that's putting it too high, he's elevating it into a factor of um, first amongst equals, if I can put it that way, into a factor of um, exaggerated <coughs> importance or unjustified importance. Now I accept at paragraph 95 that, the, that the, the judgment appears to take a slightly different turn. It does make the point the employment tribunal doesn't address the question of whether the claimant's earlier conduct, i.e. up to 1st July 2014, justified not allowing her to enforce her contractual and statutory rights when she was dismissed almost three years later. For those reasons alone, the decision of the employment tribunal on illegality is flawed. Now, two points about this. First of all, the claimant's conduct did not change on the 1st of July 2014. The claimant did nothing on the 1st of July 2014. It's only the respondent that acted. So we're looking for the, 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 the question is based upon a... Uh, a but, if, if, but, but if you're right that he was applying a principle of a contemporary entity, um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter that the employment tribunal hadn't addressed that question, would it? I, I agree, but, but but a fair reading of this suggests that, there, that that in practice, when it came to the overall analysis, what we've got at paragraph ninety-five did not figure prominently in in Mr. Justice Lewis's thinking. But what he's saying is, in fact, that um, the tribunal was wrong not to consider the question of whether her conduct. In those earlier periods. I agree. I, I agree. Read, read superficially. Well, in fact, no, he's definitely going to have to read it superficially. Well, that is definitely. I'm what sorry, I'm sorry for my no, no. superficial <laughs> reading of what looks like a fairly. No, no, I, I, I withdraw that, of course. <laughs> I, I withdraw that, of course. Well, it, I agree that's what he, that is what he said. I'm not sure I, I'm going to let you get away with just withdrawing that comment. Doesn't that actually undermine your whole argument? Can I, can I take my Lord's paragraph 98 and the, and the other paragraphs which, which see the application of 95 in practice? Can I, can I, can I take it to right. paragraph uh, 98? I have considered the quest, whether the question is one that should be remitted to the employment tribunal for consideration or whether there is in truth only one answer to the question. There is no reasonable basis upon which an employment tribunal could conclude that it, that it was required as a matter of public policy in May 2017 to refuse to allow the claimant to enforce the contract of employment and rights arising out of it because of the events that had occurred before 1 July 2014. Then this, crucial, the respondent would have to identify the burden being on him, the way in which the claimant knowingly participated in the illegal performance of the contract after the 1st of July 2014. On the facts, there could not be said to be such illegality after the 1st of July 2014. So Mr Justice Lewis, having criticised the Employment Tribunal for not having analysed post-July 14 behaviour, we say unfairly in fact, then concludes in the absence apparently of any facts by the Employment Tribunal that no such facts could be found. But crucially, on this question of disposal, should the matter be remitted, it is perfectly clear that he is, he is regarding post-2014 illegality as a prerequisite of the, of the deployment of the defence of illegality. And so, my Lord, I, 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 forgive me for using no, the no, word no, no, I was only tweaking your tone. I know. No. But, but is it really contemporaneity, I can't pronounce it, I, that I, he's I, talking about, or is it something else? Simultane, I don't, I, I don't know. It's, it's a clunky expression, and we coined it because I accept that it's not, a, it's not a, it's not an expression that's formally developed. We've extracted this as a matter of deduction from the way that the judgment is being put together. It's not, as I say, it's not formally expressed. And Mr. Justice Lewis only, in fact, relies on one case, Coral, which we say is, in fact, if it's authority for anything, is authority for the opposite proposition. I wonder if it's a, this is a good opportunity to go to Coral. Mm. Yes, well, by all means. <coughs> Coral and Barnett is a decision of... Um, it's at page 70. 
of the uh, authorities by the way, and it's a decision of the Employment Appeal Tribunal. It's important to understand what, what the, the procedural history. It was an appeal from a preliminary hearing, and the employer had asked the Employment Tribunal to determine the question of illegality, the application of the defence of illegality, as a preliminary issue. The Employment Tribunal ruled against the employer, hence the appeal, which was also dismissed. The facts which were taken from the pleaded case, not findings of fact, were that the claimant, who was bringing a complaint of unfair dismissal, began working, working in the marketing department of a casino <coughs> run by the Coral Leisure Group. <coughs> And as part and part of his duties, albeit not enshrined in the contract of employment itself, he, he complained that he was required to obtain, from time to time, prostitutes for some of the punters. And he was subsequently dismissed. And it was in connection with the, the procuring of prostitutes for punters on the pleaded case that, was, that the employer ran the defence of illegality. We remember that the, the common law defence of illegality doesn't just operate in cases of illegality, but also morality, which procuring prostitutes would, on one view, uh, uh, fall within that doctrine. That's the that's the backdrop. Um, Lord Justice uh, Brown Wilkins, uh, sorry, Mr. Justice Brown Wilkinson, as he then was in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Um, uh, gave the reasons of the Employment Appeal Tribunal for dismissing the appeal. Can I pick it up, please, at page 74? At uh, G on that page, where the submissions of counsel for the employer are recorded, Mr Carr, for the employers, submitted to us that since there was some taint of immoral purpose attached to the employee's contract, the conclusion must necessarily follow that his application must be struck out. It's in the context of that submission that the judge turned at 508B to ask a couple of rhetorical questions. Can it really be the law that an employee who in the, in the course of carrying out his duties knowingly breaks the law in one respect is thereby automatically debarred forever from enforcing the rest of his contract of employment or of complaining of unfair dismissal? Has the law, lorry driver who breaks the speed limit thereby lost any rights against his employer even if the employer knows of the breach of the speed limit and doesn't object at the time? It was those considerations that made us ask counsel for authority casting light on the point whether any breach of the law in the course of performing a contract inevitably made the rest of the contract unenforceable. Now, the, the, the crux, it seems to us, of that passage is that the, the judge was drawing attention to the fact that not every minor or trivial breach of the law can have the apparently draconian consequence of preventing reliance on the contract now and evermore. Because that was the uh, logical conclusion of the argument advanced by Mr. Carr on behalf of the employers. D d d don't worry, that happens to us all. <laughs> But, but I, it, it is striking that the assumption that underpins this paragraph is that if the defence of illegality can be deployed on day one, it can always be deployed. Just going back to the, to the, to the point that we were discussing earlier. But plainly, it's, it's, it's the scale of the wrongdoing that is exercising the Employment Appeal Tribunal in this case, first and foremost. A little bit further down the page, the, 
The question to be answered is whether any taint of illegality affecting part of a contract necessarily renders the whole contract unenforceable by a party who knew of the illegality. And then a distinction is drawn between cases in which there's a contractual obligation to do an act which is unlawful, in other words, a contract such as the one in Patel and Mirza, and cases where the contractual obligations are capable of being performed lawfully and were initially intended so to be performed, but which have in fact been performed by unlawful means. That's our category, so-called category B. Then goes on to say, in relation to category B, there's a citation from Tritor, uh, the fifth edition in 1979. Where the illegality lies in the method of performance, a party is not guilty for the present purpose merely because he performs in an unlawful manner. There's a reference to the St. John Shipping Corporation case about overloaded ships. On the other hand, a person who intends at the time of contracting to perform in an illegal manner cannot enforce the contract, and in such a case, even the other party may be unable to sue on it. And that was re regarded by the EAT as representing the law. <coughs> now, that we say is a little surprising, because on the face of it, it, it appears that the doctrine only applies <coughs> where the claimant knows of the illegality at the time of entering into the contract. And indeed, that appears also from page 509 at E. <clears throat> the fact that a party has in the course of performing a contract committed an unlawful or immoral act will not by itself prevent him from further enforcing that contract unless the contract was entered into with the purpose of doing that unlawful or immoral act or the contract itself as opposed to its mode of performance is prohibited by law. Now it is somewhat puzzling that Coral and Barnett are still cited at all in terms of approval because that passage which is the um, essentially represents the conclusion of the EAT seems to be saying that you can never have illegality by performance. You only have illegality when the party's eyes are open at the outset, or the contract is one which is inherently illegal. And that cannot be the law. Indeed, it isn't the law. Hall, Wollstone Hall and Hall refers to Coral and Barnett in terms which indicate approval. But plainly, the test advanced in, in or developed in Hall and Wollstone Hall is different from the one identified in Coral and Barnett. But in any case, Coral and Barnett is not authority for the proposition that there has to be some element of contemporaneity, if my, if my laws will forgive me for maintaining use of that expression. Nowhere in Coral and Barnett is it suggested that there has to be some coincidence of timing between the claim and the, uh, and the illegality relied on. Is that a, a, an appropriate moment? Do you, you just want to take us to where Mr. Justice Lewis dealt with this, and, and you say wrongly extracted such a principle from it? I, 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 just to tie this off. Yes, the the, <coughs> the reference to Colin and Barney is. Um, sorry, my will just give one moment. Okay. I think it's page 163 at yeah, B. Yes, it, it is. Thank you very much. Well, I can see at night, paragraph 92. At D, at a preliminary stage, the question arose as to whether, if the employee had done that at some stage, he was precluded thereafter from ever enforcing the contract and claiming for unfair dismissal. And then there's a citation from the Employment Appeal Trial. See? The very passage that we just looked at at 509E. And with respect, I, I, I don't understand, I don't, we don't follow the reasoning which, uh, which permitted the EAT to extract the so called principle of contemporary. 
I should add, actually, by way of completeness, I appreciate that my lords may have shut Coral and Barnet now. But in the disposal of Coral and Barnet, I, I don't know if, it's, if my lords still have it open. I I'm sorry for the time. Very brief point. You still have it open. It's page 76, uh, page 76 G. At the foot of the page, EAT says, we emphasise we are only dealing with the points as pleaded by the employee on the basis that that pleading correctly states the facts. It may well be at the hearing that facts emerge in completely different form. It may emerge that he knew from the outset that prostitutes were to be procured and paid for, or that the whole of the employment contract was unlawful. Which tends to reinforce my point that the effect of Coron and Barnett is rather to strip out illegality by performance of all meaning. It's difficult to see how it would ever, ever arise in practice. Mr. Lowry, I see the time, so I'm not asking you to deal with this now, but it, to me at least, there seems to be quite an important point of principle which has arisen in the last few minutes, which is actually whether Coral is correct uh, in the light of subsequent authority. Now, the, the, the difficulty may be that it appears to have been approved by this court in Hall. Query whether it can actually stand now in the light of subsequent authority or indeed principle. Um, but I don't want you to deal with that now, but, I, but, but we may have to deal with it in any judgments that we give. And it seems to me to be quite an important point of principle that you've raised. So we, we may need, if you don't mind, to have some further assistance on what Hall says about Coral. Yes. Because anything Hall says, if it's part of the ratio, is binding on us. Yeah. Unless it's been subsequently. Unless, it, exactly. And that's another, okay. that's another wrinkle. <laughs> All right, thank you, um, Mr. Laddie. We'll, we'll rise till five past two, please. All rise.